John Anik called the uh, action UFC 214 Saturday night, formerly of ESPN. He's now the play-by-play -play voice for UFC. You got a great card on Saturday night. John, welcome to the show here with Mike Pete and Dave Schaller. Thank you, boys. That was a hell of a live read right there. That's a tough ass to fall. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he's he's going to bring you uh, Octagon side with him for the next one, so you can just he can hand you the reads there, Pete. All right, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, Saturday night was a great event, and obviously some big names on that card. And uh, at the end, I guess, uh, you know, the night, what was your kind of overview? The, the, the best part about these events for me is the stories they set up and where they go. And I, I guess John Jones, you know, uh, calling out Brock Lesnar has been really making the biggest waves, right? Yeah, I just think John crushed everything about Fight Week and certainly everything about Fight Night with his performance and everything he did after the fact and, and certainly opened up a lot of doors for himself. Not necessarily that they were closed before, but there weren't a lot of people talking about them closing the gate behind him and Brock Lesnar prior to Fight Week. And I think he started to invoke that conversation by mentioning it in a chat room on Facebook or something. But... He's got a lot of options, right? There's the Alexander Gustafson fight with 205 pounds. It's a rematch a lot of people want to see. He can certainly go up to heavyweight. I don't have to tell you guys he'd be very competitive there. Even against the champion, potentially, Stipe Miocic. I think the hardcores would rather see him fight Stipe than Brock Lesnar, but the biggest money fight I guess we can make right now, even though it wasn't on anybody's radar two weeks ago, is Lesnar Jones. So Dana, I know he's going to join you later today. He said... John will probably fight someone before Brock, but all the wheels seem to be in motion for those two to fight at some point, you know, sometime maybe first quarter 2018. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, that's the thing with uh, the, the new nature of this uh, event kind of uh, world we're living in with McGregor and Mayweather. You got an event there more so than a, than a boxing match or a UFC fight. You got an event, and it seems that everybody's just jumping on board. I'll create my own event. Yeah, well, certainly John was quick to mention Conor McGregor after the fight, and I think a lot of fighters are taking notice, but as I know Dave can attest, there are a few guys that are in position to take advantage of some of these opportunities, and John Jones is one of the guys who, if he can keep himself clean, uh, can certainly take advantage, and I think he has a ton of big fights out there, not necessarily even in boxing, just in mixed martial arts, so... Yeah, John is well on his way, and, and again, I, I've been saying all day doing these radio hits, like, I don't know how mature you guys were when you were 22. I was not very mature at 22 years old. I'll be the first to admit it. So the fact that he's 30 now, his daughters were with him during fight week, things are changing for John and, and for the better, seemingly. John, take us through those first two rounds. It, it was seemingly more competitive than some folks had anticipated, particularly Cormier walking down Jones at times. How did you see it heading into round three? Because to me, I really could have scored it you know, 1919 or 2018, either way. How did you see the fight? Yeah, I don't take issue with anyone who gave Cormier the first two rounds. I think I probably had it 1-1, but I think both rounds were relatively close, and, and both rounds had seminal moments, I think, for both guys. You're right. Daniel got a lot of things accomplished early, and John even said after the fact his, his jaw was numb. I mean, he certainly got his attention with that uppercut that knocked his mouthpiece out of his mouth, and John just has a legendary chin and heart and mental toughness. We talk so much about his skills that... The conversation never segues to his heart, but he's got as big a heart for this sport as anybody. So he certainly had to lean on that a little bit early in the fight and was certainly setting DC up, I think, for, for a, a knockout of that kind sometime later in the fight. Maybe it came even earlier than his coaches thought it would. But again, I thought DC was competitive early. Just this is a hard guy to outlast over, over 25 minutes, especially when you're trying to get inside of a foot disadvantage and reach. Uh, we're talking with John Anik, formerly of uh, ESPN, now the play-by-play -play voice for UFC, called the 214 Saturday night. Uh, you get an up-close-and-personal look at Cyborg there, and, and to see someone of that athletic nature has got to be pretty cool up-close-and-personal, how quick and just uh, advanced she is, it seems like. And, and I thought, you know, considering the circumstances, it wasn't a lopsided fight. I mean, you know, um, it wasn't like she absolutely dominated, but probably in its own right, uh, something to see up close. Oh, for sure. Everything about Chris Cyborg. I mean, she's a magnet. Uh, her fan base is huge. She has great ratings on television, and she's probably the greatest woman we've ever seen. But I think what makes her so special is that she wants to mute all that noise and just improve. You know, she really does draw high praise for her coachability and her work ethic. And if she was a touch more reckless, this might have been a two-minute fight. But she's so intelligent 
and hmm. is so patient in terms of letting the finish manifest. I mean, it's certainly the first round finishes have piled up and, you know, no one had extended her this far since 2013, but she's just not in any rush. And when she's fighting a fighter like Tony Evinger, that's got a pretty good shin in her own right, it can take a little bit longer, but she's an absolute beast. Hopefully Holly Holm will be next, but it is going to take just a massive fight night performance to, to take this woman out at 145. Yeah, John, it's an interesting perspective you bring Holly Holm being next. There's a lot of folks that thought she had potentially won that fight with Jermaine Durand to me earlier this year. For you, having the uh, the best seat in the house stylistically, where does Holly Holm have a competitive edge? You talk about her taking on Chris Cyborg. Well, I think she has the striking advantage at length if she can keep it there. I think that a fighter like Chris Cyborg will bring out the best in Holly Holm. You know, Holly Holm at times with, with a countering style and a kick-heavy attack sometimes waits for her opponent, baits them in and sets them up. She could use that forward pressure against Chris Cyborg. But what I like about Holly Holm in this fight is actually her physicality, just her, her brute strength, her toughness. We saw her get choked unconscious by Misha Tate, so you know she's not the tapping out type. I like a lot of intangibles about Holly Holm. I like the big fight experience, obviously, against Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate and others. She's headlined virtually every step of the way in the UFC, five or six five-rounders. So if she can lean on that UFC experience, you know, I think that she, she can extend the fight and, and be competitive. I, I still think she's a betting underdog. And, again, it'll take the best step, effort of her career uh, to beat Cyborg. But competitive fight for sure and probably the best one, I would think, you know, in terms of the odds being relatively close that we could do in that division right now. John, we were uh, talking about before you came on, uh, Dave and I both agreed that we would have liked to have seen uh, more of the Lawler-Cerrone uh, fight. I mean, the, the huh. three rounds just wasn't enough. Although I bet if you asked Robbie Lawler and Donald, they would say, you know what, that was okay. <laughs> I mean, we didn't, we didn't get our bonus, but for Robbie Lawler in particular, this was a training camp that got extended because Schaller's buddy Donald Cerrone had a lot of different injuries <laughs> that he was dealing with, staph infection and otherwise. So Robbie was a little bit irritable, not that he is, you know, not ornery during an average fight week, but it was an extended training camp for him, and he's just such a smart fighter, too. I mean, he knows how to win rounds, and obviously has as, as crowd-pleasing a style as anybody in UFC history. I, I don't know that we've ever had a fight with two consummate fan favorites like that, where literally both guys are walking to standing ovations. It was uh, a special fight, and if there weren't so many other standout performers, obviously, Saturday, they would have left with bonus checks. Outstanding three-round fight. So, John, if uh, Johnny Bones isn't on the card, if Robbie Lawler isn't on the card, if some of the big names like Chris Cyborg aren't on the card, there's a gentleman who convincingly knocked out Jimmy Manoa that I think got on everyone's radar. For the listeners here at 97.3, can you let us in a little bit to the world of the UFC's 205 new title challenger? I mean, what is it going to take for Switzerland's Vulcan Uzdemir to get some South Jersey love? It's going to take <laughs> you asking me about him, so I'm glad you did. Right now, he's the fighter of the year in 2017, and I challenge anyone to put someone else above him. 3-0 uh, and thus far, 28-second knockout of, of a Canadian, Misha Serkunov, who everybody fancied a future title contender, follows it up with a 42-second dusting of a top three guy, I think, in Jimmy Manoa. So this guy's all the rage right now in Switzerland. He's getting really big, and this is the first time anybody has Switzerland in the UFC. So a lot of opportunities ahead of Volkan Uzumir. I still think he'll, he'll need to knock somebody else out to get a fight with somebody like John Jones. But John Jones said he didn't know who he was before the weekend, and he certainly does now. So Volkan's <laughs> doing all the right things. The, the bodies are dropping every time he, he raises the hand. It's pretty crazy. He had dynamite in his fist. Is that what he said? Something, uh, something like that afterwards. But I, I thought it was a me. I mean, he was so, uh, you know, the execution was so perfect there. Uh, that uh, Manawa thought, I mean, he was wrestling the referee. He thought he was still going. It was amazing. I mean, that just shows you how uh, vicious, you know, that he was in that fight. I mean, so as you mentioned, he had bursted on the scene that night. Uh, overall, great card. So uh, where, where from that night, where is something you're looking forward to uh, for the next big event uh, that led from this, this card? Well, it's all about John Jones, and I haven't really been able to wrap my head around, other than his personal issues as to why this guy doesn't bang out Staples Center three times a year and just become this massive superstar that is uncontainable, not unlike a Conor McGregor. So I'm looking for John Jones to take it, maybe not to that level, but to really take the horns and run with them right now, whether it's a Brock Lesnar fight or trying to become a two-division champion, a UFC heavyweight champion. I think John Jones 
on any given Saturday night right now is the baddest man on the planet. You some all elite heavyweights in training for years, so it's all about John Jones for me, and uh, I'm looking to extend the conversation on his behalf as much as possible. I, I think there's a good man in there that's trying to do all the right things and, and has for the better part of 18 months, and I'm looking for him to spin it forward you know, in a big way from here. Well, it was a good night. It was a lot of fun. It was a uh, awesome uh, uh, Saturday night, and uh, we look forward to what happens next in, in the uh, UFC world. Do you have uh, uh, you do you care to uh, throw your uh, opinion in the ring on the uh, Mayweather uh, McGregor uh, event? Yeah, well, I like that Conor McGregor's going to be wearing shoes, right? Because he's already pretty powerful. <laughs> so I think that's that's going to that's going to give him a little bit more pop. Uh, again, I think that he needs to succeed early. I think he needs to get out of a countering approach and be the aggressor. I think he needs to obviously be dirty, as any expert has told you. I just want to make sure the contract stipulations that prevent him from throwing an elbow or risk losing $50 million don't give him pause to do some Bernard Hopkins-type tactics in the clinch a little bit and throw that big melon of his around. So I'm hoping he's still aggressive when it comes to being a little bit borderline dirty, attacking that waist borderline low. Uh, and I will bet Conor McGregor at 44-1 to 1 in each of the first four rounds. Let's go. John, it's an interesting concept that you bring up there because you have to think that the intrigue for him to throw a little elbow on the inside is going to be there. But huh. I, take, I take it a step back, Johnny. You talk about this guy, Conor McGregor, and Dana and I would talk about this frequently as, as we would with Ronda Rousey. And the phrase or the name unicorn would come up, a once-in-a-lifetime type generational fighter. For you and your unique vantage point, what do you think Conor McGregor has done, not only for the sport of MMA, but for combat sports in general? Well, it's going to be hard to pass, right? And I know a lot of fans don't like when we speak in absolutes when it comes to fighters being the greatest of all time when their careers are still going on. But he is a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, and the best at what he does in combat, at least right now, and also when it comes to his mouth. You know, as far as that world tour was concerned, the best moment of it for me, as great as Toronto was, was Connor's opening monologue largely off the cuff in Los Angeles when he didn't know what to expect. There was a lot of meat in there, and he believes every single thing pretty much that comes out of his mouth, or at least 95%, whereas <laughs> Floyd, I think, is a little bit more liberal when it comes to talking about you know, an octagon and four-ounce gloves, saying stuff that he actually doesn't mean. So I'm excited to see what Connor can do. I mean, rest assured, as, as Dave and you guys probably know, Connor's walking to the ring fully expecting to shock the world if you want to put it that way and beat Floyd Mayweather so you know a lot of us are done doubting the guy I'm sure Dana will say that with you guys around five o'clock today and largely I'm done doubting him too and I've covered more Floyd Mayweather fights than I have Conor McGregor fights so I do speak at it from a couple of different sides um, I just think if I'm trying to go to 50 and 0 and I'm Floyd Mayweather it might look great on paper uh, that this guy's never had any boxing experience but there are a lot of a lot of variables and a lot of unknowns when it comes to Connor. I, I don't know. I think he, he might be playing with fire. I guess we'll, we'll find out August 26th. August 26th it is. Uh, we look forward to uh, that event. It was a great event Saturday. John Anik, formerly of ESPN, now the play-by-play -play voice UFC. You heard him on the call at 214 Saturday night in Anaheim. Uh, kind enough to uh, jump on board with us here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. John, thank you so much. And uh, it's great hearing the call Saturday night. Pleasure, boys. Thank you very much for having me.